And once again, another video blog? <laughs> is that what this is called? In any case, it's chapter 38. And I suppose the title will be Sitting on the Patio. Because that's what I'm doing. There are many views from our patio and this is one that I kind of like. It's where I sit to uh, play fetch with uh, uh, Rusty, our Doberman, and just to sit on a cool night and get a nice breeze. Uh, here comes Min, and she's bringing me vegetables. Actually, she, she's shy, so she's walking outside of the camera. What do you got there, Min? Oh, come on over, come on over. Hi. Uh, now, Min, go stand right over there and smile. <laughs> You're there somewhere. I'm going to change this. I'm going to bring it down, 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 down. Bring your hands in. Ah, yeah, that, that's perfect, that's perfect. There's black beans, there's sayote. And in the other garden that I was just filming, there's peach eye and strawberry. I told you we're eating from our garden. Hold your hand still, Min. I want there. Just hold right there. That's perfect. Now, Min, when I count three, you smile. One, two, three, smile. Ah, she's under her famous hat. Okay, Min, put him in the kitchen. <laughs> this is going out to the world. You'll be famous. Back to the garden. Here we go. Ah. All right. We'll keep that giant condom out of the picture. Ah. That's what I've been talking about. Uh, that handful of food coming out of your garden is such an incredible experience. For you city dwellers, what can I tell you? It's really hard to explain. It's got to be akin to the thrill of a hunter getting his own meat. I, I'm sure of it because they both involve work and planning and, and uh, effort. And at the end of the day, you've looked after your family, you've looked after your friends, you've looked after yourself. And if you do it right, you've looked after our Mother Earth. That's not a bad deal. That's a little aside from life on the patio. I don't know. <laughs> this is going to be, I, I, I find, I do, I do, I find, that I didn't go any farther than the patio because if I had, I would have gone in my scooter and I would have been driving under the influence. No, not, not of drug, booze or illegal drugs or even prescription drugs, but under the influence of, of MS and diabetes, both of which tend to give cotton brain, which is just like you are after you've had a couple of joints of old school grass, not this new modern super powerful stuff, but the old stuff. Or maybe half a dozen shots of Southern Comfort or half a case of old style beer. Uh, that's a brand as much as a type. But it leaves me very spacey. So I'm just sitting here on my patio. It's safer. I only do five miles an hour at tops on my scooter, but still in all, I tend to drive into things when I'm in this state, and that's really not much fun. Oh, no, that, that's not a good idea at all. What is a good idea, though, I have found, I think from yesterday, is that if I want my crazy, weird, bizarre thoughts to go out to the world, I have to make them accessible to the world. So I'm going to continue 
with Spotify Video Podcast. I'm not sure if that's a bringing together of words that aren't supposed to go. I always thought of a podcast as something that you just listen to rather than watch. But they do it, and uh, from what I can see, they do it without all those annoying uh, connections to other videos that I've got no connection to that YouTube puts up. So I'm not sure. Uh, I'm going to have to think on it. I'm going to have to post it to YouTube. That's the first thing I have to do. Once I get it on YouTube, I can then... Uh, no, actually, I don't have to go to YouTube. I told you I'm kind of under the influence. When I go in today, I can take out my memory card, download this movie to my desktop, and directly upload it to Anchor. I can cut out YouTube. That's not a bad idea. I don't get a lot of references from YouTube. Nobody likes my channel on YouTube. All I'm doing is sending out my information and having people troll and mine me for whatever they want to sell me. And I don't enjoy that. And the lady has been... Oh... I'm tempted to say nagging me, but she's not. She just made the request on multiple occasions for me to find a way to post videos without uh, the silliness that YouTube puts on them. There's nothing she hates more than going to one of my videos and finding in that string of videos underneath it porn sites. It's really not a message that I want to get out. So maybe I go with just Anchor Podcast, Spotify Video Podcast, and and dictation. This is obviously a work in progress, as is the garden that you're looking at. And by the way, uh, as you look at this garden, just so you'll know what you're looking at, the black bags, the two tiers of black bags, basically hold strawberries, some of which are coming into fruit and more are coming into blossom. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, update on the peanuts when uh, Min, the lady that's at the start of this, or Shirley, the lady that's not in this video, decides it's right, we have got more to transplant out of that original uh, group that I tried to get to germinate, if that's the right term. And with what we've got popped up now, we're going to have 12 uh, peanut plants growing. And they uh, could produce anywhere between 500 and 700 peanuts. I know, you've heard these numbers before. But I'm impressed with the garden. I mean, you saw the, the large green one that looked like a pear was a sayote. It tastes a lot like an apple, but if you just cut it up, you can put it in a salad raw. If you cut it up, you can stir fry it. Uh, I've never tried to eat it like a pear, although I suppose one could. Usually, and here's the real benefit of growing your own. Usually, by the time we get these from the market, <clears throat> time for a sip of tea. Hold on, folks, a little pause for the cause. By the time you get sayote home from the market, it's fully mature and getting old and the skin is thick. So you peel it. But we get them fresh out of the garden. And they're young and vibrant and tasty and you cook them skin and all so you get all the nutrients. It's really quite amazing. That's the glory of a garden that you're working on. And our passion fruit. Now, for years, I, I, I mean literally years, I have been calling this uh, a dragon fruit 
vine because that's what I thought it was. It turns out it isn't. When it started blossoming this year, well, it's always blossomed, but it's never got fruit before. And this year after Super Typhoon Odette, when we cleared away all of the rubble and the rabble, no, we didn't clear away the rabble. We still got that problem. But we did get rid of the rubble. And our yard was so open and had, had so much more sunlight that this year we have found out what we really have is passion fruit. And we have got a nice little harvest of uh, fruit coming along. Uh, not enough to take the market, but enough to share amongst the three families. And that's the first time that's happened since we've been here. And we've been here 20 years, give or take a year. Oh, it's, it's, it, it's thrilling for an old man to be involved in something like this. You get to a point where it is so easy to look back rather than forward at, at old triumphs and victories and disasters and mistakes and all the things that you wish you hadn't done and a few of the things that you're glad, that, really glad that you did do. And you tend, at least I was tending, not to look to the future. The garden helps there. I want to get this peanut plantation on very minuscule plantation, mind you, but I want to get it going. I want to get just the nice amount of, of peanuts and the da 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 and the coyote and if we can get fresh strawberries. We've looked at growing potatoes in a bag. We're going to give that a shot. I can look forward with this garden. I'm looking forward to watching the turtles grow. Uh, they live a hundred plus years. So they're still youngins. They're going to outlive me if well, even if they wander off, they're going to outlive me with any luck. But I'll get to watch them grow. And that's pretty neat when you think about it. Uh, yeah, looking forward to the future. Now, I am going to pull this up gently, gently up. I don't know if what I'm doing will look good or will look bad, but... I'm going to give it a try. I pull out my view screen so I can see what I'm doing. There you go, my nemesis. Two power lines right through the yard. But that, my, there. That you're looking at, giant bouton bamboo. That's our neighbors. And it covers a fair bit of our yard, but it's hard to cut down, so we leave it. I pull around, and giant bouton to the left. Giant bouton straight ahead and giant bouton to the right. And I told you, sometimes we get a nice blue sky. I'm going to pull it back to the right, slowly, ever so slowly. And we're back into the giant bouton. And there you go. Now that's got some in close bamboo. That's Buddha bamboo, and it's about six feet from me, and I can't get it out of the shot. Maybe I can, I don't know. But if I bring this down and over, ah, there you go. That, that's another view from our porch. Now, here we got beautiful blue sky, fine white clouds. Sit here, watch the cloud move behind the trees, the coconut trees that are there. Can you see the coconut trees? I don't know. Probably. But it's nice out on the patio. I like to be out here, especially at night. It's dark, it's cool. Well, it's not as dark as it was. We put in a surveillance system. And which means we have lights at strategic places. It's really kind of a bummer, but there you go. Ah, that uh, is a pretty view. It feeds the soul, so to speak. I like it anyway. I mean, one of the things I've learned in my 
strange and bizarre life. Some think it's strange and bizarre anyway. To me, it's just been normal. Is that it never hurts to live in semi-isolation where other people would love to go for a holiday. But they can't because they can't get to it. Uh, that was Ivory Island Light Station. That was Kitimat Village. That was working as a deckhand on the mission boat to Thomas Crosby Five. That was not living in Richmond or Abbotsford or Prince Rupert or Kamloops or Vancouver or Sault Ste. Marie or any of those other silly cities that I've lived in. No, you, you get the... No, not you. Why should I tell you what you get? But I get to be at home when I have more of Mother Nature than I do of cement and people. And I gotta tell you, it, people do come here for holidays, although many of them do it for the child sex trade. That's big in the Philippines. There's still slavery here. Uh, you get, and I know this for a fact, folks, this is not just rumor. White men come down here, aged anywhere between 45 and 90, with a fat wallet of dollars or euros. They start touring around in a little village or city or town. They will run across a girl that looks good to them and they will go have a talk with her parents or her guardian and if they like or if he likes her enough it's simply a, a transaction at that point. I will give you X amount of dollars and I'll have your daughter, at least her body, and her willingness until she gets fat and ugly. And then I'm going to go buy a new one. Uh, as one guy said to me, Oh, I'm looking for a new wife now. I said, Really? How are you doing? And I said, Well, I've got four of them that I'm interviewing. It is done in the Philippines. Uh, those are women or men, young boy, uh, young men, in the 16 to 21 year old range. In the six months to eight year range, parents just sell their children. They set up video cameras and they get on the web and they sell video time of their children doing obscene things to each other, to themselves. And that's the way it is. The tourist trade, the sex trade. Not all that come here, come here for that. But an awful lot do. You know, it, I mean, it is, you have seen my picture, folks, and I am not what anybody would call good looking. But when Myra, was working on her doctoral. She was going to a nice little place called Cotabato. It is in the Muslim part of the Philippines and it was very active with rebels and what have you. Uh, there were times Myra was coming home and her classmates would ask her, are you going home this weekend? And she'd say yes. And they'd say, well, why don't you take this route? It, it's very, very scenic. You'll love to go to the boat going through these back roads. And Myra looked at them one time and said, but they're through Muslim town. And they looked at her and said, yes, they are. And they're very peaceful Muslim towns this weekend. Uh, she, she made good friends that are still her friends many years later and they kept her safe for which I am eternally grateful.
because you never know uh, what's going to happen in some parts of this country. I remember one night I got a text from her, on boat, leaking. And I texted back, get the hell off the boat if it's leaking, it's still at the dock. She said, no, I'm staying. I said, okay. And when she got back, she realized what she had texted and she corrected herself. She had meant to text, on boat, roof over my bed is leaking. Not the hull. <laughs> there are times. I dare say there are times, folks. But, uh, yeah, we, we live out of the city, which is good. I, I'm not going to tell you exactly where because we like our privacy. Although I have noticed the web is much better at it. They used to, when can we add, locate your place, they'd locate us in Manila. And that's pretty far away from where we are. And then a few years back, it got, oh, two-thirds of the way closer. And it keeps getting closer as the technology gets better to track us. And they do have that technology. I remember one night when I was outside looking at the stars, and I saw a shape in the sky, and it was a drone. Very quiet, but I saw it just ghosting along. And that makes sense, because in this part of the world, they use drones. Uh, an acquaintance of mine, not to say a friend, an acquaintance, one day he was driving his jeepney. This was a white man, by the way. And the, the local police guy came over to him and said, you know, you really want to stop running that illegal lumber you're pushing. And this acquaintance couldn't figure it out because he's been very, very safe and, and did it at night and nobody knew. But he figures somebody with a drone got a picture of him because he's got a very special, unique picture on the top of his jeepney. At least he did when he owned it. And somebody got a picture of him. Now, just in case you're tired of looking at that sky, I'm going to move back over here. Uh, where am I going? I'm going right to here. I kind of like that clock, too. Yeah, I do. It's a beautiful view where I live. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. If you ever watch... Uh, gee, I forget that show's name. Very soft-spoken guy. Um, very famous. My memory is not what it should be. Oh, Mr. Rogers, of course. Who could forget Mr. Rogers? Well, I couldn't forget him, but I did forget 